Well, I'm extremely grateful and humbled to be with you and have a chance uh, to speak at this last devotional of the semester. Uh, This invitation is especially meaningful to me because I have three members of my own immediate family who are current students at BYU, a daughter who is a freshman, uh, one who's a sophomore that said this opening prayer, and the third is my wife, Cindy, who is graduating in a few weeks with her master's degree from the Marriott School. Yeah, thank you. I, I say give it up for her. <laughs> I appreciate that. You just earned me some bonus points. <laughs> I am so proud of my wife, and I love her with my whole heart and soul, and that's why affectionately I call her my sweatheart. <laughs> when you have the last name Sweat, you have to roll with it. Well, I want to speak with each of you today like your members of my own family about a subject of great importance, and I pray the Spirit can be with us as as I do so. I'm fortunate enough that a major part of my work here on campus is that I teach the Cornerstone Foundations course called Foundations of the Restoration. I love teaching that class, and I love exploring the marvelous restored gospel with many of you. At the end of every class, I have a little call-and-answer tradition that I like to do with my students. As they get ready to leave, I call out to them, the restoration continues. And as I point to them, they answer back in unison, let us continue in it, like this. All right, so I'll see you guys next week. The restoration continues. Let us continue in it. All right, God bless. Isn't that fun? But we all know it's easier said than done to continue in the ongoing restoration, especially in our day. We're living in a wonderful yet difficult time. One that I think future historians will discuss is among the most spiritually challenging eras in the history of the restored church. And it's not just our church. Uh, There's evidence, abundant evidence, that faith in organized religion in general is slipping, particularly in America. A recent study by the Pew Research Center found that while in 2007, only 16% of Americans did not have a religious affiliation, today it's 30%. In fact, the fastest growing religious affiliation in America is no religious affiliation at all. And much of the growth of the non-religious has come from the rising generations. The Pew Center reported that younger adults are less likely to identify with religion than older adults, particularly in North America and Europe. Now, while people have been leaving faith and returning to faith in all generations and dispensations, What is notable is the rate at which it seems to be happening right now and the amount that we hear about it because of amplified social channels. Today, losing faith feels fast and loud. So how do we meet the spiritual challenges of our day and continue in the ongoing restoration? Well, I don't believe there's any one easy answer to solve every important and complex issue related to faith challenges. I do believe there is something that can empower us to successfully navigate and overcome the current test that we face if if we will better understand it, seek it, and receive it. Do you want to know what it is? Well, good, because I'm going to tell you. (laughs) To do so, I want you to go back with me to the year 1835 to Kirtland, Ohio. I want you to close your eyes and mentally travel down some dirt roads and Put on your bonnet and grow your beard. You have permission to do so momentarily. (laughs) And I want you to picture yourself in a meeting with with the prophet Joseph Smith, where he is teaching the recently formed Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. Now, unlike today's Quorum, this first group of apostles were relatively young and inexperienced in the church. The oldest apostle was only 35 years old, and four of the apostles were in their young 20s, similar in age to many of you students here today. Now, you might think that everything was spiritually great at this time in American history and in the church. The Kirtland Temple was almost completed and converts were flocking to Ohio. It sounds pretty good, right? Well, think again. In the recorded remarks of his sermon to the Twelve, Joseph noted that, quote, darkness prevails at this time, the same as it was at the time Jesus Christ was about to be crucified, end of quote. Does that sound familiar to us? Joseph then proceeded to instruct them on something that he said was, quote, calculated to unite our hearts that our faith may be strong so that Satan cannot overthrow us nor have any power over us, end of quote. 
Well, what was this? I imagine Joseph giving this next line in a way that was emphatic and to the point, expressing what he felt was needed to conquer the spiritual challenges of their day. The prophet said, quote, you need an endowment in order that you may be prepared and able to overcome all things, end of quote. That was the key for them, and I believe it can be the key for us also. We need an endowment, an endowment of power. Now, let's be careful here so that we don't misunderstand. When you hear the word endowment, what comes to your mind? What do you envision? It's likely that as I asked those questions, many of you pictured a priesthood ceremony in the temple. And that's normal because that's how we often use the word. But if I can, I want to shift our thinking to understand endowment a little differently. When Joseph Smith said that we needed an endowment to overcome the spiritual challenges that we face, he wasn't saying we needed a religious ceremony. What he meant was we needed an endowment of spiritual power or a heavenly gift of divine knowledge, experience, capacity, and ability. That's how he in the scriptures often described the word endowment, as a heavenly bestowal of spiritual power. To say it another way, there is a difference between endowment and the presentation of the endowment. The endowment is a divine power, and the presentation of the endowment is an authorized religious ceremony that facilitates that power. If you and I can understand that one concept alone, I believe our time together today would have been well worth it. Our Savior revealed that, quote, in the ordinances of the priesthood, the power of God is, of godliness is manifest, end of quote. Another word for manifest is to present or to show something. The ordinances manifest or they present us with the unique covenant opportunities to access the power that God is offering, but we receive and maintain that power through righteous living. Sometimes people participate in the endowment ceremony and they may not really understand it at first, or they don't feel much different after they leave the temple from before they entered. But we don't get endowed with power in a few hours. If we understand that endowment is a spiritual capacity, then we need to develop that capacity over time through faithfully seeking to understand and then diligently live the concepts and covenants that are presented in the temple endowment ceremony. So if you and I are promised that we can be endowed with power from on high through the holy temple, what is that power? What does it look like in everyday life? What new or greater power or capacity can you have and I have that we otherwise wouldn't? Well, as I've prepared for this devotional, I've asked many people these questions, and I've been touched at the profound answers that I've heard from some. But if I'm being totally honest with you, I've also been a little disheartened at the inability of some to even give a single answer at all. They don't know what power the endowment is giving them. And if we don't know what power is manifest, then how can we focus on it? And how can we strive to attain it? Doctrine and Covenants section 107 verses 18 and 19 gives a great overall summary of some of the powers that can come to those who are endowed. They have the privilege of receiving the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, to have the heavens open unto them, to commune with the General Assembly and Church of the Firstborn, and to enjoy the communion and presence of God the Father and Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. In simpler words, through receiving and living temple ordinances and covenants, we can have greater power to receive revelation, to call upon the heavens and have them hear us, to have the promised ministering of angels to help us, and to truly come to know our Savior Jesus Christ and God our Father in very personal ways. Yes, brothers and sisters, we need an endowment. The concepts and covenants of the temple endowment ceremony, they lay out a pattern of divine living to help 
bring about these and other spiritual powers in our life. The temple is a modern school of the prophets where we enter into a covenant order of future priests and priestesses. As we participate in the temple endowment ceremony, we experience and reenact a symbolic upward journey that takes each one of us as a fallen person to being taught about the great plan of redemption, being empowered by knowledge and covenants, and ultimately brought into the presence of God to become an heir of eternal life. The ceremony suggests growth and progression from glory to glory as we increase in light and truth and make priesthood covenants to guide us in living a holy life. Elder Robert D. Hales of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles explained it this way, that in the temple, quote, we establish patterns of Christ-like living. These include obedience, making sacrifices to keep the commandments, loving one another, being chaste in thought and action, and giving of ourselves to build the kingdom of God. Through the Savior's atonement and by following these basic patterns of faithfulness, we receive power from on high to face the challenges of life. We need this divine power today more than ever. Or in the words of President Russell M. Nelson, as we keep our covenants, God endows us with his power. And oh, how we will need his power in the days ahead. To show how the major temple covenants can facilitate the spiritual power that we so desperately need, I'm going to describe five challenges that we might face as we continue in the ongoing restoration and how these five temple covenants can address them. These five covenants, by the way, have been publicly published by the church in numerous places, and church leaders encourage us to understand them. So if you will, right now, come back with me to the present and take off those bonnets and shave that beard, keep that honor code, and let's look at how these covenants can empower us to meet some of the challenges that we're facing today. We live in a time that almost worships individuality, highlighted by the profound modern philosophical slogan of, hey, you do you. We are force-fed night and day across social media, mass marketing, and political agendas with well-intended messages like follow your own path, don't let anyone tell you what to do, be independent, have it your way. These self-affirming but self-centric messages can be worthwhile in small doses, given the situation, but consumed at today's societal rate, we may be overdosing on ourselves. Christian theologian George MacDonald called the attitude of, quote, being my own king and my own subject, doing whatever I am inclined to do, from whatever quarter may come the inclination, one of the principles of hell, end of quote. Well, why? Because it stands in such stark contrast to Jesus' perfect, lifelong submission to God, defined by, not my will, but thine be done. While a common refrain today might be, you do you, Christ's covenant call to you and I is, be like me. There is power in covenanting that we will obey the laws of God and not merely walk in our own way after the image of our own God. Yes, we need an endowment. We live in a world of fractured families and declining marriage. America recently hit its lowest marriage rate since the government began tracking it in 1867. Based on U.S. Census data, the estimated length of marriage in America is just around 20 years. Many young people want to establish eternal marriages and families, but they feel like the odds are stacked against them. Well, what principle can help give us the power to meet this challenge? In the Temple Endowment Ceremony, we make a covenant of sacrifice. The church publicly explains this covenant to mean sacrificing to support the Lord's work and repenting with a broken heart and a contrite spirit. What a key, in my opinion, to relationships. I'm grateful that both my wife and I were taught the importance of repentance and sacrifice. We actually grew up with each other, and we went to the same junior high and high school. When we reconnected after my mission, the subject of love came up on the first night that we talked with each other. Don't ask me how that happened. I had come to the conclusion, independently on my mission, that the truest definition of love was the word sacrifice. 
In John 15, 13, Jesus teaches, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. In our conversation, I asked Cindy what she thought love was, and she paused and she said something like this. I think the best way to describe, describe love is with the word sacrifice. Man, I kneeled down and I asked her to marry me right then and there on the spot. <laughs> Not really. In, in reality, we took our sweet time, by the way, and we got engaged about a month and a half later. <laughs> We've now been happily married for almost 25 years. And that doesn't mean, by the way, it hasn't been without some challenges. All marriages and relationships have them. But our covenant of sacrifice with God has motivated us to lay down our selfish lives to build our family life and thus build the kingdom. That's true in any relationship. There is enduring power in learning that enduring love for God and others is grown in the soil of sacrifice. Yes, we need an endowment, brothers and sisters. We are living in an exciting yet challenging time of important social and political questions. There are compelling voices, sometimes heading in different directions, each of whom are equally convinced of the virtue of their own position. A faith challenge can come when a personal view conflicts with church teachings. Well, how do we handle this? The issue isn't whether we may think differently. Even Joseph Smith told people to not just agree with everything that he said, saying that he didn't want to be, quote, forever surrounded by a set of dough heads, end of quote. <laughs> the issue is how we go about handling the disagreement or the discussion when there are diverging views. Do we unfairly criticize? Do we judge harshly? Do we level accusations without sufficient information? Do we speak evil? Do we publicly belittle? If so, we will lose spiritual power. Returning to the 1835 meeting of Joseph Smith with the Quorum of the Twelve, Joseph told them, quote, do not watch for iniquity in each other. If you do, you will not get an endowment, for God will not bestow it on such, end of quote. Instead, let's counsel in the ways that the Lord has laid out in righteousness, in holiness, in lowliness of heart, in meekness, and in long suffering. Because the promise is if these things abound in us, we shall not be unfruitful in the knowledge of the Lord. There is power in living the higher teachings of Jesus Christ as taught in his marvelous gospel to not judge and to not revile but instead to love, to pray for, to forgive, to extend mercy, and to make peace. Yes, we need an endowment today. We live in a time of sexual permissiveness. A 2020 Pew Center study reported that of religiously unaffiliated Americans, 84% said that casual sex is sometimes or always acceptable between consenting adults. 84%. Even among Christians, 54% reported that they think it's permissible. In our day, pornography is everywhere. It's easily accessible, and it's rationalized by some to be relatively harmless. We need the power more than ever to resist getting caught up in this tsunami of sexual leniency and the damage it inevitably leaves in its wake. While some want to remove moral limits from sexual expression, Time and experience show that power without bounds is the foundation of both corruption and chaos. And there's nothing more powerful than the power to create life. Remember, even God himself has boundaries in which he abides and he won't cross, or he would cease to be God, as the Book of Mormon teaches us. Could you imagine trying to have faith in an immoral and an unrestrained God? Well, neither can I. And you and I are here to learn to become more like him. We need eyes to see that the covenant of chastity is about more than sex. It's about learning to develop a character that can be trusted, exercises restraint, respects boundaries, won't selfishly abuse power, and has the ability to create and maintain a covenant family. 
Whether we are single, dating, or married, young or old, there is divine power in developing a truly moral character. Yes, we need an endowment. We live in a world where there's a lot of pressure to be someone important, to do something big, to have a platform, and to be successful. That word itself carries the cultural weight of expectations that are on you. If I say to you, have you heard about David lately? Man, he's become so successful. What is the definition of success that you and I have become culturally accustomed to hear when I say that word? We think that David must be rich, has become famous, has lots of followers, or has some real position and prestige. He must be killing it doing summer sales, right? <laughs> Hardly any of us probably thought, oh, that's wonderful. David must have become really full of love and of service to God and his fellow men. The desire to be something in the eyes of everybody else can taint our motives. It can lead us to rationalize away ethical standards. And it can justify us in stepping on or overlooking other people in our desperate climb to the top. And it can cause us to miss out on our true life's mission. Speaking personally and candidly, I almost missed out on my own vocational career that I felt called by God to pursue because as a young adult, I was understandably yet overly concerned about living on a teacher's salary. I rationalized to myself that I wanted wealth and prestige so that I could do good things and provide opportunities for my family. But if I'm being honest with you, pride and my own desire to be praised by others were also part of the equation. And they were tainting my heart and my motives. And I'm grateful that God corrected me in many ways. Now, don't get me wrong. This isn't about money and fame and position and prominence. Many great saints have all of those and more. That's not the issue. The issue is about what we love and where our heart is. The temple teaches us as its highest pinnacle covenant to consecrate our entire lives to God, dedicating, dedicating and making holy our time, talents, and means to do His will and to build up His kingdom. It teaches us to love and to serve others and to offer of our abundance to help those in need. For all of us who are here today who may be uncertain about our major, yes, I'm talking to you who have switched it four times. The temple tells you what to major in. Major in consecration. And as you dedicate your heart to love and serve God and your fellow men, you will know what to do with your time and talents and gifts that you've been so abundantly given by God. There is power in consecrating our life in the service of God and His children that enables us to find our personal path and our purpose. Yes, sisters and brothers, we need an endowment. Now, these are just a few examples here that I've mentioned. There are so many more ways that you and I can be endowed with power through learning and then diligently living the covenant and covenants and concepts that are communicated through the temple endowment ceremony. After a recent endowment session, I sat down and I privately wrote 40 spiritual powers that I felt the endowment could facilitate in my life if I would follow its holy teachings. And that barely scratches the surface, in my opinion. There is so much that an all-powerful God wants to bestow upon His covenant children. Now, we may be tempted to think that this kind of power only applies to certain people or to other people. But remember that God's power is very personal and can be received by everyday saints like you and me if we will learn the patterns and implement the covenant concepts. Let me illustrate for you literally with an illustration. Some of you may know that I'm an artist and that I paint religious themes. See this painting of Jesus right here? Well, I didn't paint that one. <laughs> Guess what? A seven-year-old painted it who has never painted Jesus before in her life. Now, how did she do that? Even more amazing, she painted it in an hour. And it's not because she's a modern-day Monet. I don't know. Well, maybe she is. Time will only tell. She did it because she followed some basic patterns of instruction that I laid out for her and for some other primary children in a primary activity. I created a lino cut that the kids stamped on some pre-prepared boards. That gave them an outline to start with. 
Then I taught them some basic principles about highlights, midtones, and shadows. I gave them one color at a time, starting with the cadmium yellow highlights. I modeled and showed them where and how to lay the paint down like this. At first, they were a little nervous and even confused at some of my instructions, but they faithfully followed along bit by bit and brushstroke by brushstroke. Next, they received their mid-tone yellow ochre, and I showed them how and where to paint it in the center of the face. Then the same for the burnt sienna shadow color. When they messed up, I quoted them some good Bob Ross uh, philosophy like, hey, there's no mistakes, only happy accidents. <laughs> and then I helped them get back on track. Last, we filled in the Savior's white shirt, his red robe, and we topped it all off with a contrasting background color to make it all pop. They started to get so excited to see it all come together. One boy even said, hey, it looks like a real life Jesus. Some of their parents couldn't believe that the kids had done this themselves. But by learning and following the basic patterns that were shown to them, all of them had the ability to paint Jesus. Similarly, by implementing the holy patterns laid out in the sacred temple endowment ceremony, all of us can develop the power and capacity to become like Jesus Christ. In successive colors of covenants and concepts, the temple endowment presents him to us and shows us how to follow him. We may be confused at first, but as we are faithful, we excitedly begin to see him come together in every aspect and every covenant of the temple. Who has been more obedient, sacrificed more, lived a holier life, and been more chaste and consecrated than our Lord Jesus Christ? And as we live those same temple covenant teachings, we slowly begin to recognize something that looks like the real life Jesus in ourselves. Yes, we need an endowment. Now, although these primary kids were able to follow a simple pattern of instruction to produce an image of Jesus, they will only become great artists if they continue to learn the concepts of art and repeatedly practice them over time. Power and capacity doesn't come in a single class. We wish it would, but it simply can't. We must consistently put in the work. Becoming endowed with divine power is a little bit like a university program or degree. Just because we've been accepted doesn't make us educated. The education comes slowly, even painfully, especially when everything is due at the same week, right around finals, right? Rarely does learning come dramatically or all at once. Most of the time, it comes almost imperceptibly over time. The tuition of education is paid by persistence. But because of dedicated diligence, those who are getting ready to graduate in a few weeks have developed more power and capacity in their respective lives and fields than just a few years ago when they excitedly posted hashtag BYU bound. In the Lord's School of the Prophets, the Holy Temple, we similarly grow in power and capacity by degrees as we learn and then diligently implement the holy covenants and concepts over time. You and I may fail to understand some of the assignments. The temple textbook often requires a lot of rereading to grasp its meaning. But the master teacher's rubric of standards is very clear. This most blessed professor, he holds open door office hours every day. And he is more than happy to revise your grade as you redo the assignments again and again as you try to figure things out. He believes in mastery learning, and his semester never ends. But for heaven's sake, stop skipping or sleeping through his class. And don't you dare drop out because you think it's too hard or it's too confusing or it's not for you. Go to his class again and again and let him teach you. You will find yourself learning and growing and becoming endowed with more divine power and capacity as you do so. Yes, we need an endowment. So, my dear friends, the restoration continues. Make the choice today that you will continue in it. You will need 
an endowment of spiritual power and capacity to do this. The temple endowment ceremony communicates the concepts and the covenants to facilitate this greater power. Like the painting of Jesus, worship in the temple and learn the patterns and the process to become more like Jesus. And when you leave the temple, be a diligent student and consciously strive to practice those covenants and concepts in everyday life. Put in the work, practice, start again, realign, increase in your precision, and don't you ever give up. Don't ever, ever give up. God does not give up on you. Don't you give up on him. As you and I act in faith, God promises us to truly endow us with his power, even the power necessary to overcome the spiritual challenges of our day so that one day we can enter into the presence of God and receive a fullness, a fullness, comprehend that, of his exalted blessings. Let us go forth and truly receive, truly receive our endowment, even an endowment of increased spiritual power. Are you willing and ready to do so and thus continue in the ongoing restoration? If you are, remember how I close each class? Well, I want to close this big devotional together in the same way. I'm going to say the restoration continues. And when I, want, when I point to you, I want, to say, I want you to say, let us continue in it. You ready? The restoration continues. Let us continue in it. Awesome. I invite us all to do so through the temple endowment of power and in the sacred name of our Lord and Savior, even Jesus the Christ. Amen.